Hey everyone, it's Corona from The Headphone Show. Today with me, I have the Etherflow 1.1, which is an open mic headphone from Dan Clark Audio that retailing at $17.59 serves as their intro model to the Ether series. Let's have a listen. All right, let's start this video off by talking about the basics. So. The Etherflow 1.1 is utilizing a single-sided planar magnetic transducer, and in essence, it's an updated or follow-up model to the 2017 original Etherflow. So, Dan Clark Audio claims that the 1.1 sees improvements in clarity as well as detail retrieval because it's actually using some technologies and innovations that have been trickled down from their flagship headphone, the Ether 2. For power requirements, the Ether Flow comes in at an impedance of 23 ohms and a sensitivity level of 90 dB per milliwatt. After listening to them on a couple of different sources, I actually found that these were pretty efficient. I never found myself pushing past 12 o'clock on any amplifier that I tested these on uh, on low gain. Still, I think that you will want to use these with a discrete headphone amplifier if you want to get the most out of them, as I did find that there were noticeable improvements in sound when going from something like my motherboard's onboard audio to something like the JDS Lives Element 2. All right, so let's talk about packaging and accessories as you do get some nice case candy included with the Ether Flow. For starters, a custom molded Mr. Speakers branded, I'm guessing it's old stock, travel case is included. Given the Ether Flow 1.1's full size design, it's not a case that I would describe particularly as compact, but it is very easy to carry around and should easily fit into something like a backpack. Also included is Dan Clark Audio's top of the line high end Vivo, Vivo dual sided Hyros connector cable. The Vivo cable included with the Ether Flow 1.1 measures 3 meters in length and has a quarter inch termination, but it can be ordered in varying lengths and terminations from Dan Clark Audio's website. As expected from a Dan Clark Audio headphone, you also get three different sets of front damping filters that slightly change the Ether Flow's tuning. I will discuss the sonic changes that the different filters introduce once we get to the EQ section of this review. Lastly, Dan Clark Audio includes a certificate of authenticity with the Etherflow 1.1 serial number, as well as a microfiber cleaning cloth. Up next is build quality and comfort. Now, not too long ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Dan Clark Audio's Aeon 2 headphones, of which build really impressed me because they were very lightweight and they had a very small footprint. In many ways, that challenged my views of traditional planar magnetic headphone designs, which I associate with being very bulky and heavy. Thankfully, a design philosophy that is similar to that of the Aeons is present and can be observed on the Etherflow 1.1. The Etherflow 1.1 features a blend of materials resulting in a build that feels very sturdy, premium, and remarkably lightweight for a full-size planar magnetic headphone. Aside from the yokes having just a little bit of flex to them, I really struggle to flaw the build and design of the Etherflow 1.1. It really is phenomenal. Comfort, similarly, is a standout feature of this design, and I think it may just be the most comfortable headphone I have personally ever worn. The pads feature an unusual rectangle design, but they are extremely spacious and never made my ears come in contact with the driver or inner sides of the pad itself. Additionally, the already low weight is distributed very well by the headband suspension strap and ear cups, making these very easy to wear for day-long listening sessions. Altogether, I think it's safe to say that if comfort is your priority, then the Etherflow 1.1 is a great option for you. We finally get to talk about how these sound, and I'll admit that going in for that first lesson on the Ether Flow, I didn't really have very high expectations, as my last experience with a Dan Clark Audio Open Back, which was the Aeon 2 Open, was vastly underwhelming. However, what I can say now that I've spent the better part of this week listening to the Ether Flow is that they've blown away any feeling of wariness that I may have had, and they've proven themselves to be a quite fine and rather excellent headphone. Still, like all other headphones, they're not perfect, and at its nearly $1,800 price tag, it's flanked by some fierce competition. So in this review, I want to share my experience listening to them, as well as discussing how they stacked up against some of its competitors like the HC800S, the Focal Clear, as well as the Head Audio Headphone. Let's check them out. As is always the case, we'll begin by talking bass. Now, I would describe the 
base region on the ether flow as being very well controlled and very well defined. I actually find it to be significantly more articulate than the base region on the Focal Clear, as well as tighter, easily tighter sounding than the HD100S. I think that overall the quality of bass that you get, even though it's not as punchy, is about on par with what I'd expect from something like an LCD2 or LCD GX. So it does have very good bass. Also, this is probably unsurprising given that it's a planar magnetic headphone, but the Etherflow also has very good extension and it easily reaches all the way down to 20 Hertz. Something that I found interesting though while listening to the bass on these is that the sub bass region wasn't always all that present and that was likely due to the actual bass tuning. So to me it's out of the as though the frequencies under 100 hertz were very slightly downshelped, and then 100 to 200 hertz was somewhat emphasized. So there seems to be a rise there that actually reminded me a little bit of the bass response on the HD 650, which also has an elevation in that region. So you do get a bit of a mid bass punch and a little bit of added warmth on this headphone, but it still retains a clean transition into the mid range and it doesn't feel like it overpowers any of the other frequency ranges. Also noteworthy is that these respond really well to EQ. So with it, you can actually reduce that mid bass elevation and add instead a bit more presence to the sub bass. So if you're like me and you prefer a more Harman style sort of bass response, then EQ is one way to achieve that on this headphone. Moving on to the mid-range, I think it's actually very good on the ether flow. In a few words, I would describe it as being smooth and maybe even a little bit laid back, but I do think that overall it retains a very good balance that I consider to be natural sounding. Um, the lower mids are very accurately represented. So you have instruments and vocal tones of which fundamentals lie in that region of the frequency response. I find that they're very faithfully reproduced and have a good body to them on the ether flow. The one area where I do feel like it deviates slightly from my personal target, and this is a really unusual one for me, is that I feel like the upper mid range, particularly at around 3K, could actually use one or two dB more energy just to give the upper mid range a little bit more bite in the presence region and keep uh, instruments like electric guitars from feeling a little bit distant. But aside from that very minor deviation, I really do find that the mids here are, are very enjoyable and natural in their timbre. Resolution is also very good in the mids. I think that these are actually very resolving and I do think that they compete quite nicely with the Focal Clear. So I didn't find that they were quite as transparent as the HD100 or head audio headphone, even if it was only marginally so, I did find that those two other headphones did present a, a better sense of clarity in the mid range. For the last section of the frequency response, we have the highs. And thankfully, unlike the Aeon 2, I found that the highs here were actually pleasant to listen to and they had all, an adequate amount of air. Overall, I'd say that the treble range here sits a little bit on the warmer side, although there is a subtle accentuation at 6 and 8.5K that can introduce just the slightest bit of sibilance in the low and mid treble. Still, I would not describe this as being a piercing or fatiguing headphone by any stretch of the matter. It's just that those two frequency bands have just a little bit extra zing. Um, mostly, I think that the treble here was, was very even and linear. I think that they suitably textured harmonics, overtones, percussion strikes, as well as uh, cymbal splashes. They all came through with just the right amount of uh, sparkle and energy. Uh, for resolution, I think that they're also great. I think that for internal detail retrieval and resolution capabilities, they're on par with the Focal Clear. However, I do think that the highs here come across just a little bit cleaner because um, the Clear has these treble spikes up top that add just a little bit of grittiness uh, that the Etherflow doesn't have. All right, let's step aside from frequency response and let's talk about soundstage imaging and layering. So in my experience listening to them, I found these to be fairly spacious. I think that in terms of width, they came across to me as being significantly wider than something like an HD 600 series headphone and they were about on par with like the LCD2 as well as the DT1990 Pro. Imaging was also very good. They had a very even distribution across the stage. These really conveyed a good sense of positioning and directionality with no audible gaps. And instrument separation was also very good. 
Uh, I think that all the different elements in the mix had a, a very distinct space of their own within the soundstage. And these also had a, a nice sense of depth that, you know, it, it reproduced like almost like these, the distance between the different vocal and instrument lines. So, you know, admittedly, there are other headphones that do these spatial qualities better, like the Hi-Fi Mini Nanda or the HD100S, but I still feel like the Ether Flow held its own and it does make for an enjoyable open sounding experience. Moving along to dynamics, well, I do feel like these have a nice top and snap to them that can add uh, like a feeling of tension to sounds like guitar strings being plugged or piano keystrokes. These really falter quite a bit in the dynamics department. So when you compare them to headphones such as the Focal Clear LCD 2 or Head Audio headphone, you'll find that these don't really deliver a very strong sense of punch and slam. They don't have that physical impact that adds weight to your instruments and makes them engaging. So unfortunately, I think that's an inevitable trade-off when going with such a lightweight planar magnetic transducer that you really won't be getting that, that uh, you know that excursive force there so if you're looking for a headphone that kicks uh, I don't think that this is the first option you should be looking at before going straight to the conclusion let's briefly talk about EQ as well as the included filters so as I mentioned earlier the Etherflow includes three different sets of filters of varying density that allow users to slightly tune the ether flow uh, via front damping. So all three of these uh, filters actually target the slight 6A accentuation that I mentioned earlier. And the, depending on the density of the filter you go with, the bigger of a cut they will add at that frequency band. Now, unfortunately, because these are front damping filters, they do seem to affect uh, perceived resolution somewhat negatively, but I still think that they're a very neat inclusion as they allow for users to tune the headphone uh, to their liking, especially if the, the treble is a little hot for them without the need for DSP EQ. Now, in regards to DSP EQ, I really don't think that the Etherflow needs it. It really does have a very good tonality out of the box that I think most listeners will enjoy. Nonetheless, I've made an EQ profile for it just to bring it closer to my personal target curve. Um, I did make slight tweaks to the treble. However, what I think is actually the biggest change uh, from my EQ profile is, is the bass, as I do cut out quite a bit of the mid bass warmth and instead shift that presence over to the sub bass region. So if you're interested in checking out my EQ profile, um, I made a post in the headphones community forums that has, it's basically a compilation, it has all my EQ profiles for not only the Ether Flow, but all the other headphones that are reviewed. So if you're interested in checking that out, there'll be a link in the description down below. Okay, so to wrap up this video and review, the Etherflow has been sincerely one of the most enjoyable headphones I've had the opportunity to listen to recently. There's a lot of things that I really like about it with only very minor drawbacks. I mean, it has a very enjoyable, agreeable tonality. It does deliver good technical performance and it features what I think is one of the best uh, designs for both build and comfort. I think that the biggest knock it actually has going against it is price. I think that it should come down in price at least to $1,500 so that it competes more closely with headphones like the hi and Aria, Focal Clear, Odyssey LCD-X, as well as the ZMFO Tour. But price aside, I really think that it's a fantastic headphone and it's just an overall great all-rounder that I'm gonna strongly recommend. Anyways, that is all for me today. I hope you enjoyed this video or found it useful. If you did, do consider dropping a like. And if you want to learn more about the Etherflow 1.1 or other headphones, I highly encourage you to check out the review section on headphones.com, which has dozens of great articles readily available. For more headphone and audio content, subscribe to The Headphone Show to stay tuned. And until next time, this is Chrono signing off.